Welcome to the Adoptive Dad Playbook. Sit back, relax, and grab a beverage with your host, David Bischline. Hey guys, thanks for joining me today for another episode of the Adoptive Dad Playbook. Man, thanks for coming back. If you're first time, welcome. If you're coming back for second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, or seventh time, we're on our seventh episode. Thank you guys for joining us today. I'm really excited that you guys are here. Man, it has been a crazy uh, f- three or four weeks in my house. I don't know about your guys. Well, number one, welcome to spring. I'm glad spring is here. Uh, ironically, uh, I'm coaching football in this spring where I teach and coach. We didn't have a fall season. We did, we're did. we doing a spring season first, five game, the five game spring season. And our first game was uh, postponed or canceled due to the other team having a COVID. We played our first game on Friday. It's cool, awesome, enjoying it, just kind of odd. So Valentine's Day weekend, um, we had a massive storm roll through, cold for like two straight weeks. I know everyone across the country was feeling it. Well, in my house, I had pipes burst due to the cold. Seven pipes burst. So needless to say, I was able to get the water off right away, so it did minimal damage, but it still did damage. So currently, I'm in my closet, a.k.a. the studio, and there's a massive hole in the wall behind me because that's how we had to access one of the burst pipes to the bathtub. So that's great. My kitchen has a big hole. Uh, Our shower is literally gone because there was a hole when my kids shower. Basically, everything upstairs burst, including my toilet. Just finished the bathroom, but that's Murphy's law nonetheless. You know, things are going well. Uh, COVID seems to be kind of on the down. I don't know, I keep hearing that it's not, but so far, you know, we're staying healthy at my house. My wife and I both have our first shots and are due to get our second in April. Let's look at today's uh, adoption organization, charitable podcast. I'm going to pick one, and I'm going to tell you right now that my wife and I are getting a grant from this organization. So I probably have a vested interest, but it's Life Song for Orphans. And what they do is adoption, orphan care, and foster care. Uh, they're, they're really cool because 100% of what you give goes to orphan care. That's a really cool part about this. They do adoption grants. They give matching grants. So my wife and I have a matching grant through them, which means if you went online, you'd give money or you could mail a check, and then they would match it up to $4,000. So we're really appreciative of that. But they do that. So you can look up a family with their number or anything like that. They also do just orphan care. You can like adopt a child to, you know, to kind of sponsor them, child sponsorship. They've helped 16,230 children in 13 countries. Um, they also do short-term mission trips to Haiti and Guatemala. I've been to Haiti twice. Love it. But they're just an overall very good organization. They're really focused on orphans and foster care and uh, adoption. Just really good. They partner with churches and things like that. If you're interested, you can go to their website at lifesong.org, on Instagram at Lifesong for Orphans, and on Twitter at Lifesong Orphans. Anyway, moving ahead. Today's episode is a good one. We have a guy named Paul Tease. He and his wife, Cindy Tease, are the founders of a place called Camp Barnabas. They founded it, I don't know, late 90s. I had the privilege of working there for four summers. My wife and I met there. He kind of gives us a perspective of a grandpa's view, which I think is kind of an interesting view. For me, at least it was as an adoptive, soon to be adoptive dad, hopefully. Once again, if you guys like what you hear, man, give us a like, a subscribe, a five star, spread the word. Uh, We are growing, but we can always continue to grow and reach more and help more men. I would love to hear from you guys. If if there's something you like, if there's something you don't like, if you got a prayer request, if there's just an episode that you want to hear, man, I would love to hear from you on Instagram or Twitter. All that will be in the show notes as well. I'm always here to pray for you. If you need to be put in contact with someone that I can maybe help you with, please do. But I really hope you enjoy today's episode. And once again, I appreciate you guys listening. Have a great week and enjoy the episode. Our guest today is a true American hero, underwater archaeologist, kind of like, you know, if Indiana Jones was underwater, this would be him. Founder of Camp Barnabas, husband father and grandfather to two adopted little girls i have none other than the great paul tease paul welcome to the adoptive dad playbook uh first off it is an honor to have you on here i've known you now for 20 years uh and getting to interview you is pretty exciting i'm not gonna lie well i'm i'm very honored to be a part of this and thank you for 
thinking of me and inviting me to, to join in on this. I hope I can you know, provide some sort of enlightenment or encouragement to whoever's in this process. Well, I'm going to give our, our listener, my parents listen, so I know they'll, they'll at least listen, uh, our listener, a quick background of how I know you, Paul. So uh, in the summer of 2001, I applied at a place called Camp Barnabas, uh, which is a, is a camp in Southwest Missouri uh, for physically and mentally disabled adults and children. And Paul and his beautiful and lovely wife, Cindy, were the founders of of Camp Barnabas and they put up with me for four, yes, four summers. They let me live in their house. Uh, they allowed their son to come to Wisconsin to be in my wedding. Uh, I don't know if they're crazy or not. He's also a reality star. He was on a little show called Extreme Makeover Home Edition. Um, but uh, that's where I know him from. He was my boss and I still look at him as my boss. Uh, and he does look like Tom Selleck if Tom Selleck was gray. Uh, our salt and pepper is probably a better. <laughs> so, <laughs> but that's that's how I know he Paul. Dresses so, better than I do. <laughs> uh, but I have a special place for Cindy and Paul in my heart. Uh, I wouldn't have met my wife without them. And so I'm, I'm a little uh, uh, it's kind of nerve wracking to interview you just because uh, you've been such a big part of my life. Uh, you let me live in your house. Like I said, one summer, I didn't have a place to live and I was going to summer school and you let me work at camp on weekends and you let me live in your house for free. Uh, me and Trace, uh, that's his son. We lived there and it was a fun bachelor pad, really, because you were gone all the time. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, perhaps it's better. I don't know everything that went on. <laughs> Probably Even a good idea, later. Paul. Probably <laughs> a great idea. But uh, I just want the <laughs> listener to know that I, I've known Paul for 20 years and, and it's a uh, it's a real pleasure. And uh, I just really look at you as a as a role model. So um, but Thanks. so tell me, how, how are you Thanks. and Cindy? uh doing during COVID, how have you guys been uh we we were actually kind of talking about this the other day i mean we we've been you know shot twice and it's percolated and all the other things so we're we're you know we can run down the street and kiss everybody on the lips we're fine but um it it didn't thank thank the lord uh it didn't touch us like it has some families nobody in our family was in hospital uh, on a vent, that, that sort of thing. Our daughter and both of her daughters came down with it, but uh, it was a, a you know relatively mild case. They, they felt pretty bad for a few days, uh, but stayed home, that kind of thing. Sort of like you had a really bad flu kind of symptoms. And uh, I, I was worried about our son. He's a CRNA uh, down in San Antonio. And he was one of the nurses because he, he does anesthesiology. He was one of the nurses who was intubating people. So when, when they got to him, they were in pretty bad shape. And I could see the strain that it was putting on him. And so I, I was worried about his you know, his, his physical well-being, his mental health well-being, his emotional well-being, it, it was tough for him. There, there, I saw him a couple of times and he, he looked worn out. Uh, well, and, they're, the hero, uh, they're the heroes of all this, really. They're the they're beyond heroes. They're, they're whatever, they're, you know, whatever comes after heroes, uh, what, what they did. And, and so much of it, you know, you hear, you hear some of it, but it's kind of like, a lot of stories you sort of hear like the first inch of it, but it's still a mile deep after that of, of what went on. So anyway, uh, we, you know, we, Cindy and I, we, you know, we took the precautions and stayed home and, and wore masks, wash our hands every time you, you know, get up out of the chair and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so we, we weren't directly personally affected by it. Well, I'm glad to hear you guys were safe. Um, I know, especially, is Cindy still doing a little bit of nursing? Does she did any of that anymore? Just retired. Just a couple of months ago, she finally said, enough is enough. And uh, I don't blame up her license. Of course, now she regrets it. And, you know, she, she wants to help out certain times. Uh, like when, you know, here in town, when they were doing these mass injection things, she would have been happy to go down and... Uh, right help with that 
So, all right. So on the podcast, we have what are like warm up questions or intro questions or kind of quick hitters. Uh, so the first one is, what are you drinking? What's your drink of choice right now? This time of year, we're switching into more and more iced tea, getting away from the, the hot coffee, the occasional hot chocolate. You know, it was 80 today here. 80? Yeah. Uh, it's a very warm, humid evening tonight. I'm working on a bottle of water come home, do a bunch of yard work, that kind of stuff, and brewed beverages in the garage refrigerator that sometimes need a little love and affection. <laughs> <laughs> One of my favorite moments of you, and I think I, I didn't, hadn't known you very long, was that when we would go to lunch and dinner and breakfast in this big mess hall at camp, and we would always make the kids drink water. So Paul, a couple times, would take a cup, and they were clear, and you'd put water in it, you put water in it, and you'd fill it to the very brim. And then you'd put a plate over it. And then you would <laughs> flip it over. And so the rando who got that water would just go everywhere. And he's the like he's a co-founder. He's my boss. And I was like, man, this is great. If I if he's doing that, Lord knows what I can get away with then. Which we did try and got caught a couple times, but that's a different story. All right. That, that, was, that was different. That was different. <laughs> all right. So I'm going to ask you, all right, what is your, what's the one thing that annoys Cindy the most about you after all these years of marriage? Oh, you know, we, we just a couple of days ago had our 40th anniversary. Happy anniversary, uh, Paul. Happy okay. anniversary. Thank you. Thank you. I will provoke her, you know, the other night, I don't know what it was. And I was kind of, you know, sort of poking her in the ribs. <laughs> And she's, you know, quit, stop. I don't like it. You know, leave me alone like that. So I go, oh, okay, quit, stop, leave me alone, leave me alone. And did it and did it and did it and did it. And uh, she didn't punch me, you know. <laughs> she finally started laughing. But I guess it's just, you know, how <clears throat> how close to the edge of the cliff can I get? <laughs> you are a brave man. You are. I wouldn't, I wouldn't mess with you. I've fallen off many a time. <laughs> After 40 years, you've, you've hung on, though. So I'm proud of you. <laughs> <laughs> After 40 years, you haven't pushed me over as many times. <laughs> All right. So if you is there like a TV show or a podcast or a book you're reading, listening to? What's kind of the flavor right now for the for the Tease family? I just finished reading uh, a book called Mission, and it's a story of Jimmy Stewart, the actor. Oh. And uh, his his film career and then what he went through in World War II. Uh, things like that. It, it really gave you good insight into the into the gentleman. Uh, Trace, my son, sent me a copy of Green Lights, which is sort of the the biography autobiography by Matthew McConaughey, and I'm just starting that. And that that seems interesting. Right now, I'm kind of going through a, a biography phase. You know, I just read one on Charles Lindbergh and and people like that. Don't know why. Sure. I just you know picked up a book. It was interesting. One leads to the other. Well, I, that kind of leads me into um, my next question. What what was it like to be an underwater archaeologist? I've always wanted to kind of ask you about that. I don't think I've ever really asked you before. Everybody thinks that you go over the side and you go down there, and you know here's the captain's skeleton, and he's got one foot on the chest and a cutlass in this hand, and you know the the skeleton to the parrots on his shoulder, and he's his one hand on the helm and all like this. That's not it. It's black water diving. It's friggin' nasty. Things bump into you that you don't know what they are. You know, there's things down there that will eat you. Uh, this kind of stuff. And, and a lot of it, it's just, it's very slow, methodical work. Uh, and because you have to be very careful, you know, in, in archaeology, sort of the irony of it is when you excavate a site, you learn all you can from that site, but the price you pay is it destroys that site. It's no longer intact. And so when, when, you, uh, when you're working on submerged sites, there, you have to be careful. Any wood that, that's been underwater for you know two or 300 years, if you bring it to the surface, it dries, it shrinks to nothing. The, the cellular structure, uh, structure changes and all, all this kind of stuff. Um, and then there's the, the issue of diving itself. Uh, you know, Cindy and I met scuba diving uh, in, in Austin in, in the scuba diving club. 
but you you have to be aware of bottom time, how much time you're underwater, those, those sorts of things. There's a lot of factors, but it's, uh, I love the research as much as anything, uh, finding out stuff. Um, why, why did this vessel land here? And, and, you know, we did, we did a riverboat mobile Harbor and that was just flat, nasty diving, uh, just, just nasty. Uh, but then we were doing a project down in Belize in Central America. So the diving was real pretty, but, uh, uh, it, it was shallow. So you had a lot of current and wave surge, uh, pushing you back and forth. And when you finish the end of the day, you were beat. you you were just physically worn out. Um, but it, it was, it was a, Wonderful adventure, grand adventure. Wouldn't trade it for anything except uh, family, and that's that's why I, I quit doing it. When I would come home, and my son's looking at me, kind of like, nah, I know we've met, can't quite place you, but I know we, I know we met somewhere. Then you sort of go, okay, I've, I've been gone too long. <laughs> yeah, you had to have brought up some some cool treasure. What's one of the coolest things you found while you were doing that? Uh, actually, in Mobile. When, and it was, it was a shallow dive. What it was, they had taken a, a riverboat built in St. Louis. We, we found that. Uh, and uh, it had taken it down to Mobile, and they blew out the hole to block the channel. They were trying to force the Union fleet to, to have to sail around certain gun positions, stuff like that. Well, when they were scuttling the ship, they tore down the old Mobile courthouse, all these old bricks and filled them in the hole just to create more of an obstruction. And we had to move every cotton pick in one of those bricks, thousands of them. But we found some that uh, you could tell whoever made the brick when the brick was still soft had grabbed it and the imprints of their fingers were in the brick. That's incredible. Still. And, and so you, now you look at that, and of course, there's no way of knowing, but but uh, uh, that's sort of the romance that pays for a lot of the nasty diving in the work. And then when we cleared everything out, I went down, I was doing the photography uh, on the site, and we had the main deck cleared, and I went down on that deck, and I was the first person that had been on that deck in 150 years and that's that's pretty neat that is pretty cool that's a that's a, neat, uh, that's a neat thing i always wondered that and then you for our audience then you decided to start camp barnabas we did barnabas for 20 years for 20 years technically what city was that i forget what city was in exactly it was there in purdy yeah purdy, that purdy, was purdy. i remember that now. Uh, you know the blinking yellow light <laughs> in the downtown area. <laughs> it's kind of like right the modern version of Radiator Springs if it was in Southwest. <laughs> and, and uh, but you know we had the the office in Springfield eventually. Uh, of course, you know we had the office out at camp and things like that. We we started focusing business more in Springfield because we were missing opportunities, fundraising opportunities, being out at camp. Somebody would call and say, oh, I had lunch with so-and-so. I wish you would have been here. You, you need to meet that person. But we, we weren't there because we were doing things. So that's why we moved the office into town, into the city. Right. Kind of you know, logistical, economic, PR reasons. Yeah, that, and, then, and then you've, uh, you've, uh, you've moved back to Texas, and they, they live right next to Chip and Joanna Gaines. Isn't that right when you told me before we started? <laughs> Oh yeah, we have coffee every morning. Yeah, you live right next to that farmhouse. They've redone your house. I can tell right now. Look at that. I see their ship lap, their ship lap and there's recessed lighting in a big island. Right there. Uh, no, but for, for the listener, for the listener, Paul and Cindy Tees and their two kids were on Extreme Home Makeover. That is legit. I'm not making that up. I remember when they came in, and Jay Scott oh, was the camp uh, manager at that time. And, or whatever his feel was. And they came in and they like started, uh, uh, I don't know why, no, he wasn't yet, was he? He was just there. 
But I'll no, he came on year after Paul right. Morris was there. Paul and Kelly. Paul and Morris. Okay, okay, the Morris. And I remember they tear down. He lived in a really old A-frame, and they came in and they built that sucker, and it, it was fast. They they do it in a week, and, and the the two things that really really impressed me, the quality of workmanship was phenomenal. Yeah, you know, we, we're kind of thinking, gee, they're going to throw this up in a week. It's going to blow over in the next strong wind. No, that was never the case. They did quality work. And then secondly, when we woke up the, the first morning after everybody had left, there, there wasn't a scrap of paper. There wasn't a, a drop nail. There wasn't a cigarette butt. There wasn't anything. The place was immaculate. They didn't leave anything behind. Uh, and, and I thought, that's that's a first rate outfit that it was that. fun to, it was interesting to kind of see i would come out in the evening sometime and kind of look and you got to go to disney world right now where they sent you to disney world uh we went to hilton head south carolina and loved it yeah you guys had a great the, vacation. The people out there the hilton hotel were uh indescribably gracious and friendly and just spoiled us rotten in fact it, it got to the point where i, I, I told the kids I said, you know, when you're walking through like the lobby or something and, you, and you'd go past the gift shop and you go, oh, that's a neat book or that's a neat something or other. We'd show up in the hotel the next day or in our room the next day. And, and so I went, don't say anything. I didn't want to be greedy. You should have been yeah. like, I like that Ferrari outside. Is that available? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that new set of golf clubs. Yeah. <laughs> no, but that was really neat. Uh, and yes, their, their son was in my wedding. Uh, and so it, we just, and they really have let me live in their house. They've always been very generous. You, you and Cindy have. So the reason I have you on is, is much as I love talking about that. I want to hear and the audience would like to hear about what it's like to be the grandpa, like it, to go through that process of adoption. Now your daughter has, they've adopted two girls from China and uh-huh. why don't you just kind of share with us kind of what it was like to be the, to be a grandparent, to be grandpa uh, through that process. Well, you know, you, you start off, uh, our, our daughter is doing this. So you're still mom and dad. And you worry about, oh, we got good news, da 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 Oh, we've got bad news. You know, so there, there's that emotional roller coaster that goes on. And you're, you're encouraging, you're trying to, you know, don't, don't give up. This is going to work out. Have you tried this or that? And, and, you know, Cayman, she, she leaves no stone unturned. Uh, and, and when she made up her mind that they were going to do this, there, there was no turning back. Uh, when they went uh, to China and went over and met Kirby uh, for the first time, their, you know, gotcha day uh, kind of thing, and they did a FaceTime back with us and you know you're excited but you're you're trying to be cool about it because here's this this poor little bewildered child suddenly with these strangers because came and said you know you're in this sort of office lobby kind of room and uh you're waiting in there and then these these two two or three staff members come in from a door on the other side of the room with your new daughter and they sort of go here and turn around and walk out. Boom, done. This is the, the culmination of two years of background checks and, and filling out forms and paying, you know, thousands of dollars and the whole process, the whole massive process. And suddenly it's like here, sort of, you know, good luck and God bless. And yeah. off they go. And then, of course, a poor child who – everything she's familiar with, everything she knows changes. And she's going to spend her, the rest of her life, which, you know, she has no concept of that uh, with these two strangers. Um, and so it, you, you want to be just crazy excited about everything, but you tamp down your, you don't want to overwhelm this, this poor little child. They came back to the States and they stayed in Houston for a couple of weeks, just, just the three of them, just so let, let's all get acquainted. 
here's the house, you know, all, all these kinds of things. And uh, it was on my birthday that uh, came and called and said, hey, let's, let's meet at this restaurant in, in Brenham. Yeah, Brenham, Texas, home of Bluebell. Uh, it was kind of halfway. Oh, that's a home of Bluebell? Bluebell? I love Bluebell. They don't sell it in St. Louis, though, and it makes me sad. You, you should be. You should be very heartbroken. I, I'm not going to tell you what I had for dessert tonight. I, I'm, I, so when we go to Springfield or Rolla or uh, really anywhere, I bring my knockoff Yeti cooler and I fill it with. <laughs> and it's like a joke to people, but it's legit. I'll, I'll fill that. Sucker. I, even though I'm trying to lose weight. I'm sorry. Go on that. You said Bluebell. It got me all excited. Yeah. OK. When, when we were at camp, this was this was, you know, before you came. I mean, the first couple of years. Um, oh, what was the town? It was west of us, south and west of us. They had a super Walmart, and they had Bluebell. We found out they had Bluebell. And so we would put camp to bed at night. And when all everybody was down, we'd tell leadership, all right, we're making a supply run. Of course, that's how we lived back then. I mean, you know, we if we had a dollar, we'd buy a dollar's worth of food, you know, that kind of stuff. <laughs> and uh, we found out that this Walmart – had blue belt, we would drive. It was like 40 miles each way, but we would go to that Walmart and always get, uh, it was Wade and Cindy Moses. Yep. With he us married us. Those. He married us. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, Wade, Wade and C. Joe. Yeah. He was a guy. And that's probably, you're probably thinking of Neo show. That's it. Yeah. That's it. Neo show. We would go over there cause we could get blue belt. <laughs> so, you know, we could have gone to Monette 12 miles away. Heck no. We're going to drive 40 miles so we can get some stupid ice I know cream. why you went to Neojo, because it was a nice trip out of camp, and you wanted to get out. <laughs> All right, so I'm uh, sorry. I interrupted your story. Sorry, yeah. listener. Uh, go on. So you, you're going to meet your granddaughter at oh, a restaurant wow. it, it, outside of Houston. In Brenham, Texas there. So we go, and uh, it, it was the same sort of thing. You, you, you don't want to overwhelm the child. Because, I mean, you know, her, her little eyeballs were just, you know, what plan am I on and who are these aliens that are around me kind of thing. And I, I would, you know, she had some colored pencils, so I'd, I'd draw a little bit on the menu and then put the pencil down. And she'd kind of look at me and then she'd draw. So, you know, just very tentative uh, connection. And then I remember at the end when they were leaving, Cayman was holding her. Yeah, I think it was Cayman. Might, might have been Douglas, but uh, I was playing sort of hide and seek, you know, where here, here's mommy's head and I'd, I'd look over this way and then uh, Kirby would sort of lean over and look and then, you know, I'd go back this way. And, but I, I did it sort of slow, very, very easy play. And she finally, after a few times, kind of caught on and I got a little bit of a smile out of her and that sort of thing. But it, it just took so much restraint Cause you just want to grab them up and love on them. And, and uh, you, you want them to know they're, they're safe. You know, you're, you're home, you're with your family now and you're safe here, but you don't want to overwhelm them because they're, they're already having to process so much. Um, right. How long, know. how long would it, did you say to you started to be able to like love on your granddaughter like that? Like it, it, how long do you think that process took? Oh, I mean, where I could really do it, uh, where, you know, where it was safe uh, to do it. She had to have some surgery on her legs and, and pretty, pretty significant. And then, you know, after, well, it actually was on her hips. And so anyway, she was on a body cast from about her chest to her ankles all the way down. And in a way that was really good for her in Cayman because she was totally dependent on Cayman for everything, whatever went in, whatever came out, everything. And uh, so we, we would go down and, and you could play games with her and, and that sort of thing. You, you could interact more. Trace had uh, Hazel uh, during one of those deals. And so she got to hold her cousin you know, so you started doing more of the family things and things like that. But uh, it, it was it was really hard because you could tell 
uh, in the surgery, uh, Kirby's muscles would be cramping or, or, you know, whatever. And she'd be in intense pain, but she had been told, don't cry. If you cry, they won't like you. So she, she would look at you with this face of, uh, stoic strength, um, that I'm, I'm not going to show any emotion there, there might be just a, a teeny little tear and it, you know, you just want to let it out, kid, you know, it's okay. Right. Just let right. it out. Um, but it, it just, you know, the, the relationship just built and we, we got to clown around a little more now, uh, when they come to visit and stuff, I don't know. I'll sit on the sofa and Kirby will come and sit next to me. There's a connection. You know, I like to think it's, it's, uh, she's with her granddad, his granddad, her granddad's with his granddaughter, number one granddaughter. You know, and it's not a question of favorites or anything like that. She's funny. She's got a quick sense of humor. I like the way you put number one. It was like, you were like, you're a dad first. I think that was great. I never thought about it like that. You know, I'm looking at it from such a dad perspective, but I think that's really good. But also I like the fact you, you emphasize restraint because that's something Greta and I really have to start thinking about it as we prepare, hopefully to bring home our child at some point is that cocooning period mm -hmm. where it will be hard. I know, I hope my parents listen and, and it's hard because I'm sure they'll just want to you know, hold her and all that. And it's hard. You have to restrain. Oh, yeah. I love that. That was great. It, it's a, it's a very human emotion and, and especially you know, now as a granddad, uh, the kids come in and part of it I get to, part of it I'm expected to grab them up, torture them for a minute, then grab the next one and, you know, count ribs and all these other sorts of things and do, you know, goofy granddad stuff. And give them too much sugar and then send them home. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> so, your your granddaughters, your two adopted granddaughters, they are from uh, China. Have you no. have you encountered like people saying things to you like, "Oh, that is that really your granddaughter?" How do you handle that if you've come across things like that? No, uh, thank heavens we haven't, because I think I'd probably punch them in the face. Birthplace is absolutely immaterial. It, it doesn't mean a damn thing as far as I'm concerned. Uh, this is my granddaughter. Her mother is my daughter. You know, Kirby and Margo. Margo is named after my mom, uh, yeah, Margo Burchell. And so, you know, that's that's special. But uh, uh, Kirby is she's my granddaughter, and and I won't uh, I won't take that. I, I will not allow that to happen. I I just. It would be, you know, grossly disrespectful for one thing, but uh, don't don't pick on my granddaughter. Right. Like, and so that's kind of leads my next question. Like, I think some grandparents, especially international adoption or adopting a child uh, that is not of your race or culture, mm -hmm. like, what could you like dis like kind of disprove some misconceptions? Because I know, and don't take this the wrong way, that the older generation, like my parents' generation, they view things differently. Like, do you have any? words of wisdom or like maybe dispel some of those misconceptions you may have being a grandfather to other grand grandparents, grandpas. Cayman and Douglas very intentionally there, there's a large Asian population in Houston and uh, several of their favorite restaurants are Chinese restaurants, but I mean Chinese restaurants, not, not going to pay way and, you know, Panda Kitchen and this kind of stuff. Uh, these are the ones where English is very much a second language. Right, right, right. Uh, that kind of thing. And uh, because it's, it's they're, they're very open about it. Yes, you were, you were born in China. That's right. But now you live in Houston. And this is mom. This is dad. Uh, Cayman's asked Kirby a couple of times if she remembers anything about <clears throat> China and Kirby always says, no, she, she really doesn't. And we don't know if because she was so young uh, that it, you know, you, you don't know what you were doing when you were two years old kind right. of thing. No, I, I, I get that. That I just wonder, because I just and, know there's, you get a lot of those comments or just, you know, it's just kind of this misconception that, oh, they're not biologically mine. 
that I think that sometimes older generations struggle with that concept some. And it's great to hear that I, I, that for you, you yeah. never had that. You haven't had to experience any of that. It, it, it's never crossed my mind. I mean, I mean, honestly, it, it, uh, um, yeah, I mean, I, I know where they're from. I know they look different, you know, physically, but um, they, they still have a little bit of speech pattern, I think. Uh, Margot has a little bit of uh, a speech impediment still, but they're, they're working on it. But it's more of just, I think, just a speech impediment, uh, not because her original language was, was Chinese. I, I get uh, that. So... Let me ask you this: Being how has being a grandpa changed your life? It's it's the best job in the world. Um, the 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 hardest thing to deal with the hardest thing to deal with are my grandchildren's parents. <laughs> they drive me friggin' crazy. You know, I think I think many people would say that. Yeah, I think it's crazy when grandparents will sugar their grandkids up and then send, ship them home. <laughs> I mean, that's that's you know that's legit. But you know, when you when you're at at uh, they they call me Paul Paul, okay, Paul 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 Paul, and Cindy they call Cuckoo, okay, uh, and uh, you know rules are different when you're with Paul Paul and Cuckoo. But we go out in the yard and and. You know, I've got one of those mesh swing things, and, and I push them on it, and they swing mad, and spin it around, and uh, they get real dizzy and fall over and, and, you know, this kind of stuff. And you have these hovering parents who come whipping in and scoop the child up as soon as they hit the ground, and I'm like, leave them alone. They're fine. You know, no, you don't know, Dad. It's, it's different, Dad. I go, well, it worked on you, you know. <laughs> Leave the kid alone. The kid's fine. There's no blood. Nothing's broken. They're fine. You know, <laughs> <So>. <laughs> that's you know we couldn't even wear open-toed shoes at camp and listen to you now. Just letting the kid just fall over. The place. <laughs> that that is awesome. All right. So if you were to your role as a grandpa, like what would, what advice would you give to any any grandparents that are going through the process with their child? What's something that you would say to what, what could they do to help? Like what's something, what's a positive thing you could tell them to do? You, you're a, you're a safe place for one thing. They, they can, uh, they can come to you and, and talk to you about stuff and you get to teach them so much and, and you get to have fun doing it. Uh, and, and they learn, learn things, but you know, you can, you can do the dumb get dad jokes and, and, and that sort of thing. Um, but it's not that you, you take sides between them and their parents. It, you, you can't do that. You, you've got to back the parents up, but you can talk to their parents separately, privately. Um, may, maybe the kid says something to you. There, there's a struggle going on. They don't want to tell mom and dad about it. Uh, so you can help them deal with that. But you're, you're a very safe place. Kirby will come in and, and just the way she sits down next to me and then just kind of snuggles in sort of thing. And, and I'll just put my arm around her. Uh, and she may ask, you know, why, why did they do that? Why, why you know? How come he's allowed to throw the ball that way or something like, you know, little things. She's just being curious, but uh, there's, there's a bonding that goes on that she knows she can ask me anything. It's, um, you know, like I said, it's, it's a, it's a safe place. You're, you're a safe person to be with, to be around. As grandparents should be, they should be that safe guiding yeah. force. Uh, it, and it's fine line. You've got to tread uh, in being a safe place, but you can't be a hideout. You, you've got to, if, if there's something, if they're struggling, if they they're want to share something, you got to let mom and dad know. And that's where, you know, you're, you're back then to being a dad 
So you're going from being granddad to dad with these two de- different generations. You have to be, you have to tread carefully. Gotcha. And you, you've done a good job of that. So usually we, we, we're gonna, we always end the show with what I call fit down questions. And so here's your first one. These are kind of quick hitters. What is your favorite thing to do with your grandchildren? Yeah. I mean, you know, goofing around in the backyard on, on the swings or something like that. Uh, and, you know, fixing a bowl of ice cream, some deal like that. Cause you know, when, when Pawpaw fixes ice cream, there's ice cream, but then there's, you know, you want nuts on that? You want, cream, you know, here, how about some chocolate syrup? Oh, Let's I'm get sure a squirt of whipped cream on I don't on doubt him. that. I don't doubt yeah. that. You, you <clears throat> are good at that. You know, it's, it's, it, what do you want in it? Sure. We got that, you know, uh, kind of thing, but it's, you, you get to, there, there's a there's a, a degree of silliness that goes on, and it's it's fun to play. Part of it you're you're expected, you know. Uh, when 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 Papa makes a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, you know it's this thick, uh, kind of thing. Uh, those those sorts of deals, uh, you know. Uh, if Papa makes the pancakes. It's shaped like a heart or yeah. It's supposed to be Texas. looks like Florida. Well, you know, <laughs> well, I, I tried to make that, that house pancakes once and it looked like Mickey was like a serial killer. So if it makes you feel any better, uh, <laughs> yeah. so I didn't try that. All right. One question I ask everybody. And, and so basically you have a billboard. What would you put on a billboard for prospective grandparents, prospective adoptive grandparents? Like what would you want to tell them if they're driving down the road and their children are considered adoption, what would yeah. you want to tell them? I know billboard. Be, be in it um, up, up, up to your eyeballs. Um, you're you're, you're going to revert. Remember, these are your children who are doing this. So you've got to love and encourage, offer help, but also know when to s- step back you know, kind of thing. They're the ones dealing with the agencies and the background checks and the whatever. What, you know, what, what do you need? I'm here. What, what do you need? And then you look you for. I love that way you put that. Yeah. What do you need. I think it's been so insightful to hear just from a grandpa, just kind of that step. And I know you don't like being called a grandpa. You know, you said that was a biased of me, but it's the truth. And I, I and uh, you know, <laughs> I not call your grandpa. Um, <laughs> So I am in and, your closet. Well, I am in my closet. Every, the listener knows I do it from the closet and because uh, it's the great, great acoustics. It even makes me sound better. I have a face for radio and a voice for nothing. As I said, in the- <laughs> Oh, but I, all right. I'm going to end a little differently just because um, Paul, kind of a, it's more of a comment than it is a question. You, you and Cindy, have made such a positive impact on so many people's lives. You've been such a father figure or a grandfather figure. Um, what gave you the courage to do it? Cause you know, I think a lot of times when it comes to guys and adoption, I think a lot of times they're afraid to do it. And, um, and like you, you and Cindy have just impacted thousands and thousands of people. And I, and I know my life was impacted in such a positive way. Like what gave you the courage to step and do all the things you've done in your life? Uh, it, it's, that's a faith question. Um, it, it never felt wrong what we were doing. And it, it always felt like we were doing what God wanted us to do. Um, always. And then when, when things weren't working, you know, you were, you were too much of the, the square peg in the round hole situation that was God's gentle way of going, this, this ain't it, you know? And, uh, you, you learn at that point, you, you step back and you really do lay it at his feet. You know, I, I can't do this. I'm stumped. I, I don't know what to do. I don't know how to handle it, whatever it may be. And always, always, always the answer came through. And it was just knowing that, uh, he would work things out. He would take care of things. And our 
job and, and all the stuff we did at camp. So we were asked this last night when I was telling you about having dinner with a, another organization. Um, it was never a job. We never worked at camp. You know, it, it just, it never was. We really loved what we were doing. We loved the people we were with. And as long as God kept things working, then you, you knew you were going the right way. Sometimes, you know, you'd, you'd hang against the sides, but you knew, you knew the trail that he had laid out for you. So it, it was always just a feeling that this is what he wanted to happen. I love, so I like you, the way you, you, I like the way you put that. I mean, you always, it is the truth because I think in adoption, it's so hard. And as you know, being a grandpa, the journey is not, is not easy. Uh, and there's so many people that are impacted you know, the no. birth mother, the child, the grandparents, the, the, the family, my, my three sons, you know, uh, you know, even uncles and aunts. And I, 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 I loved it. And, and I know you and Cindy are so have gone out on faith so much. And I think it just kind of, it's kind of like adoption in that aspect. You just go out and, and you know, it sometimes it may not work. Like when we lost our first, when our first placement didn't work, it was really hard, but I know that God's plan is greater than mine. And, and there, and that probably, I can't imagine I, that. Must have been. Well, I mean, it is, but I, I know it's his plan. And I, I, I think you guys did it to hook up a lot of people and have kids uh, making a lot of purple. Uh, so, you know, <laughs> we, you know, we should have charged a finder's fee. I'm telling we, you, man. we missed out on a heck of an income. Stream. I mean, <laughs> the, the we, we were trying to think back. We came up with like two dozen marriages that oh, came easily. out of camp that we could remember and probably 50 kids you know? i mean we we, we were talking oh, yeah and you, so back in the old day there used to be these old unair conditioned cabins and these were old school wooden on like <laughs> block and, and unair conditioned i'm gonna say that again unair conditioned all right and the girls are on the, the girls were on the south side i think the boys were on the north side and so you could Pretty hang much, out. Yeah. You could hang out on the path. The path was cool, but if you stepped over to the guys or girls side, it was making purple. And uh, it, you were there's been a lot of making purple. Uh, uh, I mean, you you have three. There's three kids and, and soon to be a fourth, hopefully, uh, in our house that you're responsible for. Uh, uh, you know, like Matt Brock, Jason Piston. You know. Um, oh. Jay Scott, I, I, I get the number of weddings that I've been in or been to, but I mean, you and Cindy, I, I, I think your story personifies adoption and just the unconditional love that you showed the staff and, and the campers and, and the volunteers, or many or whatever they were changed over the years, CIAs. And I know there was legal reasons for that, but uh, all the people that you've connected and it, and it is adoption. You you adopted everyone that ever walked in those gates with your faithfulness. And, and I, I'm thankful for it, uh, meeting my wife and my kids and just the experience I had. Uh, but, uh, and that's, you know, and if for the listener that doesn't I mean, know, I, mean, I never thought of it in that context. Yeah. That's, I, that's a good are, picture. You are, a, you, you adopted yeah. every camper, the love that you showed, the love that you showed to the staff. And, and then it all, it all, it's like a snowball. It all rolled downhill. You showed love to everybody just unconditionally, um, some more than others, which I understand, you know. Uh, <laughs> I was a difficult child, all right? Um, but um, <laughs> so, uh, but I, 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 think, I think you and Cindy Tease, Paul and Cindy Tease, you are the personification of, of adoption because you've loved everybody unconditionally, no matter where they've come from, never ask questions. Um, if they're there, you know, doing their job, even if they didn't, you still loved on it. Maybe you had to make hard decisions, but that's, that's parenting. That's, that's, that's part of being a parent. So I want to thank you. And I know that there's th tens of thousands of other people that would thank you, but if you ever, the listener, if you ever want to know what adoption really looks like outside of physically adopting a child, Pons and DTs are the ultimate adopters in that aspect. They take adults and children uh, that came and the, and anybody who walked through those, well, rode through the gates and I guess people did walk uh, were, were loved on uh, and even a guy like me. Uh, so, and I appreciate that. So Paul, I, I cannot thank you and Cindy enough for all that you've done for me and for coming on. And uh, I, yeah, I, it, I, I, you guys are awesome and I love you both. And uh, uh, I appreciate you coming on tonight and I hopefully that the listeners get something out of it 
Yeah, I did. I loved it. So it was cool just to catch up with you. So Paul, thank you so much, man. It's, it's good. You've aged well. You've aged well. I'm proud. I do of have you. a little more gray. I'm not quite. Yeah. I'm not quite Paul T's level yet, but it's getting there. All right. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Paul. For coming on. Thank you, Dave. Thanks for inviting me. I'm I'm very flattered and very honored. And uh... man, what a great episode! I want to thank Paul for coming on and sharing. His honesty was just phenomenal, and I loved it. It was me. I kind of fanboyed out. He was my boss, but I love that man. And he's done so much for me in my life. Like I said, he let me live in their house. His son was in my wedding. Just him and Cindy T's are the true love that God shows for us and for orphans. And they really are like orphan lovers. They loved everybody that came to that camp. Even someone like me who was super annoying and just really annoying and again, really annoying. But they loved on me and they loved on everybody that walked through those gates. And it's just incredible. So I hope you guys have a great couple of weeks. Come back, listen once again, follow us on the socials. Love to hear from you uh, at the Adoptive Dad Playbook at Gmail. Sp- spread the word, tell your friends. And once again, man, just have a great week, guys. Be safe and enjoy that spring weather. Thanks for listening to the Adoptive Dad Playbook. Be sure to follow us on social media.